Ladies and gentlemen, please join your, put your hands together to welcome Sri Anand Sharma, Member of Parliament and Deputy Leader of the Opposition in the Rajya Sabha. May I request uh, Sri Rachesha, President Fiki, to please present a green certificate to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Sri Anand Sharma. Thank you, Mr. President. May I invite uh, Mr. Rachesha, President Fiki, to please Welcome the Honorable Minister. Thank you and good evening to all of you. Truly very delighted to have Sri Anand Sharmaji with us. As I think we all know him over the years, we have heard him seen him a very active participant in the political arena. He is currently the Honorable Member of Parliament and Deputy Leader of Opposition in the Rajya Sabha and has been a prominent face of the Indian National Congress. Over the years he has had many important positions in the party and the UPA government including holding the very important portfolio of Commerce and Industry Minister. In that tenure we at Fiki had a great opportunity to work very closely with him. He's been a good friend of, uh, of, uh, of Fiki over the years. We have enjoyed listening to you. And I remember when I had come over to your place a few weeks ago, uh, we were able to discuss so many issues from you know demonetization to accountability in parliament to WTO, FDI and defense and obviously elections which uh, I think your party has got a strong boost. So congratulations to you and the entire Congress party for this great result. Sir, you have also been a very prominent voice in understanding not just the political landscape, but also the economic complexities in India as well as outside. So we hope that today we get a chance to not only hear you, hear your views on this, but also get a chance to interact with you. I'm sure our audience has a lot of questions for you. So after your speech, we will have a few questions which will uh, be, you know, very honored to have your views on. Thank you very much again. Thank you, President. May I invite Mr. Sharma to address us. The President of Fikki, Shri Rashid Shah, the incoming President, Shri Somani, Sangeeta Reddy, Mr. Chenoy, the past Presidents present here, Y.K. Modi, Josna Suri, Vikramjit Sani, and also Harshpati Singhani, at least uh, all included because if I am not mentioning any name. 
members of the national executive and AGM of Fiki, ladies and gentlemen. I'm hap happy to be here in your midst today. But for one year, that was last year, I don't know whether it was design or default, there was nothing at my end. I have been coming here for almost 10 years or more, engaging with you on matters of shared interest and concern. We have always been of one considered view that irrespective of what happens, it is our country when it comes to opportunities or accessing those opportunities, the challenges that we confront, we as a country must have the ability and the wisdom to do so together as a united India, not a country which is bruised by partisan politics, not a society which is divided by hatred, intolerance, violence and mob lynchings. The latter part has hurt India deeply, its image, its own self-confidence. There are many disturbing images that have flashed in recent years out of India, which do not belong to India, to our culture, to our philosophy, to the land of Lord Buddha, Mahatma Gandhi, or Swami Vivekananda. None of them would have ever approved of what has been said and what has happened. And that's something the time has come to pause and reflect for us as a nation and a society. I was talking to a host, Shri Shah, and others. That is good, you are talking about building a new India. What is this concept of a new India? Where does this originate from? I must say that mere words or rhetorics do not make a nation. Last five years, four and a half years, we have been satiated, overfed words. Stand up India, start up India, make in India, great India, move India, new India. There's a long list. Does that change India? And what kind of change? That's the fundamental question. We are a civilizational country. There have been ruptures in our history because of alien rules and colonization. Irrespective of that, and despite the partition of 1947, which was imposed on our country, not our own choice, but it was unavoidable by the colonial rulers through an act of parliament that was passed, not by the Indian National Congress or the All India Congress Committee session, but by the House of Commons, the Union of India Act, which partitioned India. But India emerged, though hurt, bruised, partitioned, thanks to the vision of the leaders. In particular, after the assassination of the father of the nation, or the Mahanayak, of India's national struggle. His close comrades and lieutenants, Jawaharlal Nehru and Sardar Vallabhai Patel, both of them and others. Let's not forget the list is a long one from Rajendra Prasad to Maulana Azad to Lal Bahadur Shastri and Pandit Gobind Pallabhant and Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. These were the leaders who after Mahatma's death and in particular, the first two I mentioned, the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, who stabilized the country. Why I'm referring to that? Because we have 
to our surprise and many of us who are keen students of history to a shock been told where Sardar Vallabhai Patel belonged to and the castigation, the insults heaped continuously on one of the greatest Indians of all times respected globally, Jawaharlal Nehru, who spent the longest time in British prison. Except for those who went to gallows, he spent almost 14 years. He was the one who, when you look at what India is, and two of the greatest, I'll say, masterpieces of literature and history, which were written, the glimpses of world history and the autobiography. Both were written in prison. And the last one, when Congress was banned, perhaps many people have forgotten, the Congress party also was banned. It was declared illegal. All the leaders were in prison for three years. And that was written on rationed prison paper without any access to any library. There is no cut, no blemish. The manuscript is preserved. If we don't bring about the change, the manuscript may be burnt by those who are custodians today. Because they want to change India. For that, they have to burn that, those chapters of history of our country. I'm deliberately referring to it. That India has been respected globally for what we are. A beautiful bouquet is the diversity of this country. Let's not forget that India is multi-religious and multilingual. India cannot accept and India will not be great nor advance if there is imposed uniformity. Particularly for sons and daughters, those who have aspirations, and young people are aspirational, those who want to connect with the globe, with the world. If there is an imposition as to what they should wear and what they should eat and how they should behave and how they should talk, that is not the new India, I'm sure we won't. Your perception of new India would be different. But the change should always be for the better. Change which gives more strength to your society and to your country. Change which propels India forward. And that's where we need to reflect where we are. We remember 2014, and rightly, there was enthusiasm, there was euphoria. And nobody can deny that. That's a fact of history. There was a big change. And the Congress party suffered its worst defeat. And the BJP its best victory. Today, you have to question honestly whether the verdict was read correctly or overread and overinterpreted. Not by those who are present in this room, but those who thought that this is a departure. I'm afraid that was not the people's verdict. At that time also, I remember coming to Fiki the very next year and telling that yes, it's true, and the changes there in democracies, governments change and governments come and go. But at the same time, let's not forget that 69% of India have voted differently. We have a multi-party democracy. We don't have a presidential system. We don't elect a Trump. Or we don't have a non-elected Xi Jinping. We don't have that system. People elect members of parliament. They vote parties. Mandates are fragmented. But there was a 
period of great hope that there will be transformational change in India. The economy will gallop forward because everything was wrong with the previous government led by Dr. Manmohan Singh. We conveniently forgot and on our part the greatest fault was we could not even counter the narrative built against us. The perception was that we were a corrupt government led by a man of the integrity of Dr. Manmohan Singh. There was policy paralysis. Everybody was convinced there was policy paralysis. And our economy was stagnating. Now let's connect to what was the hope. It was a tsunami of a hope. Two crore jobs every year. Destruction of black money, not people's money. That was also a promise. There were other commitments which were made to our farmers. Especially those who are fighting even today, even today, to get a respectable remunerative price for what they produce after toiling hard. They, they have not got it. The youth have not got their jobs. Your economy after the policy paralysis was buried on 16th of May has not skyrocketed. Therefore there are questions. In democracies questions have to be asked and those in power, those who made those promises have to be held to account, which the people of this great country shall do. We are in a different role today. So in opposition, we have a right to voice the concerns of the society and the people and to question the government of the day, like we were when we were in office. Where is our economy today? I know that the finance minister came yesterday. He did his job, like every year. And the future ministers will do their job like the same way. But the point is, we are never tired of hearing that we are the fastest growing economy on this planet. Fine, it's good. No Indian would wish India not to grow. If any Indian thinks that India should not grow faster, then that person, whoever he or she may be, has no right to any position or to command the respect of our society. Our country must grow. This country is a great country. It has enormous potential. We have human resources. We have great institution builders. The whether we have grown to our right potential, if not, why? That would be a moot question. My concerns would be a growth which has not seen employment or job creation. So we are a country of 1.3 billion people with 65 million Indians being young. So we always talk of a demographic dividend. Many years ago, some of the friends maybe here in Davos, I had said in a different context that we are conscious that if we do not create opportunities and enable and empower the youth to access those opportunities in our economy, this dividend, demographic dividend, may become a whirlwind. You will not be able to contain it. If the governments cannot create jobs. You can enable a cl climate or nurture an ecosystem which helps in creating those jobs. For which what is absolutely an essential is investment in education, training in skills. For a country like India, a leap in manufacturing. Because the services sector have their limitations, 
I have always been of this view that irrespective of whoever may say what, developing and assimilation of high-end technologies in manufacturing and taking the manufacturing to where we wanted in our objective, adding 10 percentage points from 16 percent of GDP to 26 percent of GDP is the right answer for India. Because the services sector, as you leaders of industry know better than me, services will ride on top of the manufacturing strength, not otherwise. Most of the services. Except for the IT section. But now, we have allowed a situation to develop where rhetoric clouded the reality. There was no economic crisis of 2008. There was no financial crisis of 2009. There were no successive droughts which Dr. Manmohan Singh's government faced. Where we are, by fudging numbers, you know, normally if you cheat in a school, you can be disqualified. Parents are called. Punishment is there, isn't it? Copying, cheating is not accepted. Can it be accepted as a country? Your entire national data has been fudged. You all know, we all know, the world knows. The world knows that I have failed and I threatened the teacher, hey, give me 10 extra marks, bacha pass hona chahiye. This is what India has seen. And we have insulted the credibility of the institution of the Statistical Commission of India, the chief statistical officers of India since 1950s have been globally respected. Look at the names, they have been legends. Even today when you talk of TCA Anant or Pranab Sen, these are not the people who belong to a political party. They are great minds of India. They gave you your national data. Nobody, no government, let alone a mutilated successor body of the planning commission, which had a plan, which had a purpose, has any right to destroy the credibility of Indian statistics and Indian data. But that has happened. So the world is confused that was India lying between 2004 and 2014? And now another, the cat is out of the bag. That three years ago, the real data of the back series data was available. And the Niti Ayog, I know many of them have worked with me. I'm not finding fault with individuals. If they, but they, if the individuals lose their intellectual morality, then the respect is gone. That they were not willing to accept. I'm willing to accept whatever has been achieved here. I'm not going to dispute because these are not individual achievements. It was not Dr. Manmohan Singh's achievement. Or for five years when I was the minister, or for five years when Kamal Nath was the minister for economy. These are not individual, these are institutional, these are national achievements. That's where we were. So average was 7.8% by the old series of your GDP growth. And the back series of UPA 1 and 2, as calculated earlier, three months before, was 8.12%. 8.87 and 8.39, 8.12 is the average. 7.3 is now. So by just saying that, no, 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 you, you can just trash that India didn't grow in those 10 years. That's not going to change the narrative. Why I'm saying it? As I said, that the concern is jobless growth. Concern is lack of investment. Let's not be carried away by the FDI figures. These are not FDI. The FDI definition stands changed. When I was looking after my responsibilities as the Minister for Commerce and Industry. I had a big fight with the Finance Ministry, but for five years I dug in my heels and never accepted 
to change the definition of FDI by including foreign portfolio investments and FII in the definition of the FDI for the country because I have been clear then and I am clear now it has to be tangible investment which creates leads to capital formation more factories are opened jobs are created I am not interested in counting that money which goes out at the press of the button as it has happened since the beginning of this year 33 billion dollars have gone out is a fact so 33 billion maybe 33 is a small number but 33 billion is close to 3 lakh crores that's the flight of capital now how would you rate an economy which is growing good that an economy which attracts investment investment has fallen by 7 percentage points which is not a healthy thing private sector does not have that much of money to invest banks do not have money to lend now the government will change it and create a great new India by poaching on the contingency reserves of the country that is with the Reserve Bank of India that's that's what the threat is today so if investments are not taking place gross capital formation is in the negative existing capacity utilization of the Indian industry was down to by one third and still it is down by 24 percent as I'm speaking to you that's the non-utilization of the capacities that were created exports there has not been a global glut why we are not exporting if you look at the numbers from 2004 to 2014 from close to 80 billion dollar in 2004 May when Bajpayee demitted office and 167 billion in 2009 that was a difficult year because of the global decline we left the Indian exports only merchandise exports at 323 billion now this year after five years of the great growth we are crawling to where we left yesterday was 26.5 billion so we are almost crawling and I'll, if that is to be celebrated that we have finally reached and left for you what we inherited I'm sorry it should have been 500 billion plus if not 550 you are growing, growing at an average rate of 16 percent so if all these all the four engines like of an aircraft of the economy investment capital formation job creation and exports are down how is that flying over continents that's the question the numbers don't lie final number cannot be fudged so we had an economy which quadrupled in one decade can anybody doubt that or question that it's a policy paralysis period corruption it was 480 billion close to that in May 2004 when the much maligned great Prime Minister dr. Manmohan Singh left office we were plus two trillion dollars now with all the magic all the rhetoric at least it should have doubled in five years I'm not saying quadruple we took 10 years to quadruple have we doubled it the answer is no so there is a difference between fact and fiction propaganda is there and that propaganda is unmatched you'll see more of it I know finance minister said there will be a lot of rhetoric from where is it coming we don't have the money for that rhetoric you have seen what the electronic media who controls it who controls most of the media never before we have seen this kind of money 
to build personality cults or to have a propaganda blitzkrieg? Have you ever heard that in a country which is developing where farmers are committing suicide, long marches of farmers, large number of unemployed people, lot of people having suffered, that you have a political party which spends 4,297 crores on advertisements, beating Netflix, Amazon and Unilever put together. Wow! Which money? Whose money? Black money is eliminated. Where did it go? These are questions which we need to ask. And next two months, 4,000 crores have been sanctioned by the cabinet. 2,000 crores for January, 2,000 crores for February. Of the great achievements. So what the poor people are confused. That what is the reality? So we, uh, when I stand here, I'm bracing myself to face that situation. That how will we cope with that kind of assault? of resources and propaganda. We don't get... Anchors have become propagandists today, most of them. I have no hesitation. I'm sure some cameras are there, you can report. I say it. What will happen to our democracy? The mass media, ever since the 1960s in America, if you go by the various commission reports, it is made clear about the social commitment and responsibility of the mass media. You have to have free media, but the free media must also be fair. But if you control everything, how does the, do the people know what is the truth? So that's what we are seeking to convey. What we have in mind is to try and find a way forward in a democracy, because things don't remain frozen. It was said when I was asked to speak that, well, there have been elections. India always sees elections. We are grateful to the people. We will not say it is us, it is them. Whether in Rajasthan, the numbers may look close, but the real numbers are different. I was explaining to some of your colleagues. Or in Madhya Pradesh or in Chhattisgarh. The most erudite party leader ever produced in India, Mr. Amit Shah, has been never tired of telling the country what the map of India is and where the Congress was confined. I want to, you to invite him so that I can ask him what is the map of India. Neither he can change nor I can change. That will remain the same. But in democracies, the colors will keep on changing. They'll never remain frozen. That's what democracy is about. If that is frozen, then there is no democracy. Then there is no voice. Then the vote is meaningless. And that's what is happening in India. This is a big challenge. I personally am of this view that we need to restore an environment where bitterness, abuse and vitriol is removed. I am not the one who will ever say that those presently in office did not intend to do something good. But at the same time, I'm not willing to accept that all those who built India had to be disparaged for us to believe that the journey of this country started on 16th May 2014, not 15th of August 1947. I'm afraid, respectfully, I'll differ from the words which I've heard a lot. 
that in fact is full of ignorance and arrogance. This combination is a lethal one. Arrogance itself is dangerous. If you add to it ignorance of history, a lack of respect for your civilization, for your achievements, then the end result can be very bad. And lastly, let me tell you, some of you may have forgotten, but the people of India were really hurt. And now we have discovered, traveling across the country, the hurt of demonetization is there in rural India, with the farmers, with the workers, with the housewives. They lost everything. Then overnight, those who were going to clean the black money, insulting people's money as black money, 5,000 rupees and 1,000 rupees, 500 and 1,000 rupees. 86% of the nation's currency was invalidated. We had said then, we say it now, the Reserve Bank has spoken. It's a different matter that every institution is under assault and the great India has seen departure of two Reserve Bank governors. Which institution is left intact today? I want to ask this question. See, in a constitutional democracy, what we invest in are institutions. Individuals are immaterial. Prime Ministers come and go. Nobody is immortal. No government remains in office forever. But the institutions that serve the country, that serve our democracy, must be left intact. And that's my biggest concern today with the present rulers, that they are destroying our institutions, whether it's the Reserve Bank, the CBI, the ED. You name one institution. India cannot become a new India or a great India if it destroys what it has built after its independence. I'll not say much. I've said enough. I would like to thank you once again. Thank you. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was a very comprehensive speech and a lot of comments and ideas. Any questions from the audience? We'd like to have... We seem to know... Questions? Yeah, please go ahead. If we move away from India, and I ask you to give, and you are a global expert in this, uh, just a question, Brexit advantage India or disadvantage India? You see, India is... Uh, not a major trading power. Those who say that it may leverage us and our exports, those would be very limited. You look at uh, what uh, Britain imports and the basket of the imports. A sizable part of that will continue to be imported from the EU. I have no doubt in my mind because it will be very difficult for them to disentangle, to move away completely from the trading systems, from the customs and excise unions. It will take a while. But the concern would be beyond Brexit. What we have seen is Brexit, and Trump, and the global trade wars. 
that is what will affect India very severely. Because today, the global trading system is under attack. And those who are the proponents of the WTO, or the promoters, the votaries, are attacking WTO. And those who were skeptical, including India or China, we are concerned, now we are supporting WTO because you need a rule-based and rule-governed global trading system. So our concern should be more about those, these global cross-currents and the trade wars and the rising protectionism and the new barriers to trade. And these barriers, in the, form of the protectionism is in the form of raising of duties. So there is no certainty if there is a global uh, trade and the environment is unstable, unpredictable for a country like India which must aim to and continue to strive to double its exports every three years, it will hurt us. Yes, please. Uh, sir, my name is Manmohan Bhagat. Right. I am the chairman of a fairly diversified group of companies. As usual, sir, you have said what you have said and establish it with facts. It's not just uh, rhetoric, just uh, speech, but everything you have mentioned, you have supported with solid figures, data, from historical to economic development. Sir, one cannot miss this opportunity of asking you after the recent uh, excellent performance by your party, how do you look at the general elections next year? <laughs> Let me tell you one thing about the performance. It could have been better, but uh, when you look at the numbers, they don't give you the real story. Chhattisgarh, of course, the numbers too would have been different, but not in their favor. They have, they have won 15 seats, they would have won 3, maximum 4. But thanks to the vote division in those constituencies, where Mr. Ajit Jogi's party and BSP took away a sizable chunk of votes, leading to the victory in those 12 seats. Otherwise, it was decimation. Madhya Pradesh, there have been close contests. But in the real heartland, these are the heartland states of the country, what you need to look at is the, what is the closure of the gap. The gap was very big between the BJP and us in the Hindi heartland in 2014. So we have crossed that. So you have to look at it from that perspective, which has lifted the morale of the Congress rank and file. Because these were direct contests between us and them. So this myth of invincibility of Shri Narendra Modi and Amisha combined is destroyed for good. But the beginning was made, if I may say, with humility in Gujarat. Whatever was the final result because of the urban areas, Surat and Ahmedabad, the real story is different. The fact is that they lost 14% vote in Gujarat and we gained 13% vote. This is the reality. So going by that, we know that it's, they are going to fight back hard. I just told you about their propaganda budget, publicity. But the people are wiser. If people had to go by what Arnab Goswami and Naviko Kumar say, then they will remain in office forever and will remain in opposition forever. But people, are, voters are very wise. Particularly those whom we think are poor and they don't have the same big television, they don't have all these gadgets, they are the ones who decide and they will decide correctly. I can say that we are determined and these elections beginning Gujarat have steeled our resolve. The more abuse has been hurled at our leaders 
more insults to Nehru and Indira Gandhi that has angered the Congress workers and the people. And 2019, our mission is very clear. We'll throw them out and bring a new government. Yes. So thank you. The media has been very patient for the last one and a half days. And there's one particular gentleman who's raised his time five times when I've been <laughs> asking a question. So I'll, I'll allow you this last question and it's up to uh, Mr. Anand Sharma to answer or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. Yeah, but Mike is coming to you, just one minute. So all of us can hear what you're saying. You've been the most successful uh, Commerce Minister, the highest export in your tenure. Now looking at the United States market now and the current situation between US and India, US has imposed certain tariffs on India and India has announced retaliatory tariffs but they have not imposed it and they have postponed it for almost three, four times now. So how do you look at it? What is happening? And there are negotiations going on and all that. You see, no country has a right to impose punitive tariffs, particularly on a country like India. We are not China or Germany, which are a major exporting country. So, and with the US, we have an important partnership, a strategic partnership. This move should not have been there, nor the denial or visas, H-1B visas, are making them very difficult for our people. So it's for the government to take it up firmly with Washington. Diplomacy must have gravitas. A photo opportunity or a hug does not make a sound foreign policy. I'm making it clear. Look at if America imposed punitive tariffs on China, they retaliated. Here we are supposed to be the strongest. We postponed or deferred four times. What message are we giving to them? That you keep on beating us and we'll keep on prostrating. Message should be firm. If you do this, why did we reduce 50% on Harley Davidson? Trump is more interested in uh, these pistachios and peanuts and uh, Harley Davidsons also, besides other things. Raise the duty. Send the message that if you do it, we will also do it. It's not that it's going to hurt any economy in a big way, it won't. But the message has to be there. They should be told, if you will do it, we'll have no other option. Thank you very much, Mr. Anand Sharma. May I now request Mr. Sandeep Somani, President-elect, to propose a word of thanks. Thank you. Anand Sharmaji for being with us. Whenever I've heard him speak, he always speaks extempore. And the other absolutely delightful thing about him is he speaks from the heart, as you all heard. So very frank, very forthwith. Thank you, sir, for being here with us today. He's an old friend of Fiki, and we will continue to use his wise counsel and wisdom in the years to come. Thank you, sir. I'll be, I was very brief, sir, because we have a National Executive Committee meeting that uh, we all have to get to. Thank you. So all the NECM members are requested to please uh, proceed for the NECM where we had it yesterday. Downstairs, right? Uh, you're going down to the NECM meeting.